what is relational wisdom? Basically, relational wisdom is living out the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and love your neighbors yourself. Well, both those commandments are 100% relationship. And it's really what the Christian life is about. How do we worship and serve and engage God, and how do we love our brothers as we love ourselves? Um, relational wisdom, I, I, you could think of it as an operating system. I've got my computer up here. It's a PC, I use Windows as an operating system. Some of you probably have uh, Macs, you have OS. Um, every computer has a basic operating system that is the central point for all the other programs. Word processing, uh, photography, email, everything else has to interface with that operating system. Your relational skills is the basic operating system for your life. It's gonna affect your marriage, your parenting, your work relationships, your Christian witness, everything is affected by your relational skills. And my experience working with Christian ministries, churches in particular especially, is when there's problems, those problems usually have to do with relationships. Um, I always tell people, I've never seen a pastor lose his pulpit for poor Hebrew skills. Now we might spend a lot of time learning original languages, which I think is important, but I've never heard a group of elders say, you know, our pastor just doesn't have good enough language skills. It's always a relational breakdown, a difference in vision, how we deal with conflict, how we deal with personalities. And so the principles I'm gonna share with today are things you can use in your friendships, in your marriages, in parenting, in workplace. All those venues, these same exact skills apply. Um, in particular, just thinking about ministry, where all of you spend most of your time is in some form of ministry. Um, historically, people, when they've hired employees, we typically look at a resume that, uh, that displays people's, what we call their technical abilities, sometimes called their hard skills. And these are things you can look at and examine with their, what are their degrees, what is their GPA, what certifications, what experience do they have? Things that are really related to their IQ, their intelligence quotient, how hard they work, how intelligent they are, how diligent they are. And in many, many organizations, they think if you've got a really good resume, really good technical expertise should be very valuable to the organization. But I think if you've been working in the real world for very long, you realize that's not necessarily true. There's another component, and that's your relational abilities, uh, which is often called your soft skills. That's what human resources people talk about. You've got both hard skills and soft skills that impact your effectiveness in an organization. There's only one thing wrong with that formula, in my opinion, and it's the operand. It's not a plus sign. It's actually a multiplier. Because if, if, you, had, if you were on a scale of 1 to 10, just off the chart hard skills, 10 out of 10, but you were a 0 with soft skills, 10 plus 0 is 10, but 10 times 0 is 0. The, most, um, the person with the most impressive resume I've ever seen, who I hired, turned out to be the worst employee I've ever had. He was a disaster relationally, and I finally had to fire him, even though his hard skills were off the chart, because his relational skills were so bad, he was difficult to work with, and he also impacted other people in the organization in such an adverse way. So as the Bible says, Proverbs 22:11. He who loves purity of heart, whose speech is gracious, will have the king for his friend. If we have good motives, if we're there to serve one another, to help one another, to serve the Lord, to advance the ministry, it's not all about me, but it's about actually serving others, loving God, serving my neighbor. And if we are able to communicate in a gracious way, in an effective way, we'll be very valuable to an organization. But if we don't have those qualities, then we can be very uh, harmful actually to an organization. Now, life is all about relationship. Everything we do basically has to do with how we relate to people um, in the workplace, in our marriages, in our families. Um, and the closer we are to people, the more vulnerable we are to being hurt. You think about it, you're rarely hurt or disappointed by a relative stranger, a casual acquaintance, because your expectations are so low, you don't have them. But when a close employee, a longtime friend, a spouse, a child turns on you, it can be devastating, just devastating. And because, because of this, um, relationships can be very challenging. And part of that is just the power of emotions. We are so driven by our emotions, for good or for bad. And just illustrate just a little bit of the dynamic of how, relate, how emotions affect a relationship. Here's just a simple little clip to show that. Now, 
you could spend a lot of time and analyze what's going on there, but I'll just share this one basic principle. There's a lot of people in this world who are fixers, and I'm, I'm a maximum fixer. I'm a lawyer and I'm an engineer. And <laughs> if, if someone brings me a problem, I want to just move right in and start fixing it. When I'm in my office and people are paying me by the hour, they're very grateful for me to move very quickly and solve that problem. My wife doesn't have that same perspective. When she comes to me with something, what she's really looking for initially is understanding, compassion, empathy. She usually doesn't even need me to tell her what to do. She's very bright. She mainly wants to just have someone to share those, those concerns with, share some of those emotions, have some compassion, and think it through, and then she's all ready to move on. And so if you're a fixer like me, you have to learn how to sort of slow down and listen and exercise some empathy. If you're a person who sometimes wants to just stir emotions for a while and go on and on and on, I've had people sit in my office and they'd sit there happily all day just sharing all the pain and all the sorrow and all the difficulties. At some point, we have to move them on toward a solution. So we have to be sort of aware, how do we respond to our emotions? Uh, do we just stuff them down? Do they rule us? Do they dominate us? If you try to understand emotions, that's a lot of what rel relational wisdom is about, is understanding the physiology and the theology of emotions. We are emotional creatures by God's design. He's made us with our emotions. Uh, as I work with some churches, I almost get the feeling they think that Satan came up with emotions. We're, we're so suspicious of emotions. We're so, you know, just push the emotions aside, get your theology right, think right, everything be okay when in fact we are emotional creatures by God's design. And emotions have a physiological manifestation. They affect our heartbeat. You can see neural activity now. We can study that tremendously with uh, functional MRIs and other devices. But all sorts of things that show up because of emotions that affect us physically, what we say and what we do is usually driven by some emotions. The word emotion literally means to move, and that's what emotions do. That's what God gave us emotions for, is to move us to do things. For example, we see in the Gospels, Jesus comes out of a boat on the Sea of Galilee, he sees the people, and he feels compassion toward them, and he moves to minister to them. So there's an example of a positive motion of, uh, from, from an emotion, but there's also negative emotions that move us, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, jealousy, all of those things can move us in a very negative direction. So we have a phenomenon sometimes called amygdala hijacking where impulses come into our brain, they come to the limbic system first where the emotions are, and it sets off action real quickly. We're, we're either frightened, we're angry, something like that. Most of you can probably think of a time where something happened and you blurted out some words that within moments you wish you had never said. And that's just because the emotional part of your brain kicks in first before the, the rational part of your brain has a chance to think. Literally, when your emotions go up, your reasoning capacity goes down by as much as 15 IQ points when you're highly emotional. And there's a physiological reason for that. I won't go into it, but it actually happens. So learning how to control our emotions, how to manage our emotion, I've dealt with a lot of employment disputes where somebody in a moment of anger just said something to a coworker or to an employer, to a supervisor, and did a lot of damage in a work relationship. So we've got to learn how to guard against these things. So let me give you a real quick overview of a theology, a way to organize things the Bible says about our relationships. And I would submit to you that the Bible teaches that relationships are basically three-dimensional. We're in relationship to God, we're in relationship to ourselves, and we're in relationship to other people. Now some people think, are we really in relationship to ourselves? Absolutely, we live inside our skin, we live inside of our emotions. And this is why we see Psalms where the psalmist would say, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so troubled deep within me? There's a lot of introspection, a healthy introspection in the Psalms. They say, what's going on inside of me? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling that way? Why am I being tempted to go this way? Is that a wise thing to do? So those, those are the three dimensions. In each of those dimensions, there's two dynamics going on. There's an awareness dimension. What do I know about God, who he is, what he's like? What do I know about myself, my strengths, my weaknesses, my interests, my emotions? What do I know about this other person? What is she going through? Why is she feeling that way? How am I impacting her? But then there's also an action component. How do we engage? How do we engage God? How do we respond to him in faithfulness, obedience, and trust? 
How do we engage ourselves? How do we discipline, exercise self-control? And then how do we engage other people in a constructive way? So these are the six basic skills of relational wisdom. God awareness, God engagement, self-awareness, self-engagement, other awareness, and other engagement. Those are the six skills we need to master. Now you'll find those, those dynamics throughout scripture. In fact, I would submit to you that you can put virtually every verse in the Bible into one of those three zones. Because everything in the Bible has to do with either loving God, controlling ourselves, living a godly life, or engaging our brothers and our sisters and even our enemies. Everything in the Bible fits into that grid. And here's an example of just one passage that covers all those things. It starts off with a focus on God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's a God awareness, God engagement section. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clander, clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. What's going inside of me? I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm feeling malicious. I need to control that. I need to put it away. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving. That seeing another person, the struggles they're having, responding in kindness, tender-heartedness. And then finally, it loops back up to God. That's where the 360 comes in our name, is you go a full 360. If you can have healthy relationships, you know how to function in all those zones in a continuous fashion. Um, now you could, some of you may say, well, I don't see those terms in the Bible, self-awareness, uh, self God engagement. You're right, those, those are a human construct. But you do see words like remember. Remember the Lord your God. Remember the one who brought you out of Egypt. You see words like faithfulness, which would be a, a good synonym for God engagement. You see words like humility. Can we look at ourselves honestly and accurately? Self-engagement would be disciplined, compassionate, servant. Now those are the ideal, and ideally we would live inside the circle. Unfortunately, we sometimes forget God. We're fearful or we're fickle. We're proud instead of humble. We indulge our, our desires and emotions. We're insensitive, we're manipulative. So sometimes we're outside that circle. And part of the Christian life is the process of sanctification. How do we discipline ourselves learn our strengths, our weaknesses, what are our passions, and how do we grow in Christ-likeness? And that's the whole process of developing relational wisdom. So there's just a concise definition of relational wisdom. It's your ability to discern emotions, interests, and abilities in yourself and others, to interpret them in the light of God's word, to run it through scripture, and then to use those insights to manage your, your relationships, your responses as constructively. And all of this is motivated by the gospel. Real, true relational wisdom, what distinguishes it from all the other systems the world has to offer, is that we are driven by the gospel. Our motive to love God is a response to what he's done for us through the gospel. And even our motive to love our brother or sister is because of what God has done for us. We also have a pattern in the gospel that Jesus initiated reconciliation. He didn't wait for us to come to him even though we were the guilty one, he was the innocent, he moved toward us in relationship. He moved toward us in forgiveness, in mercy, in compassion. So we see a pattern there. And also through the gospel, we have the power, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to give us discernment, to give us compassion, to, to do things we don't feel like doing. And that's why Jesus can be so bold as to say something like, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Without the gospel, you simply cannot do that in a, in a consistent way.